Bushell. Did I pronounce your name right? No, that is correct. Leonard Bushell. Bushell. Okay. Oh. And you are the author of High Confessions of a Cannabis Addict. I am. You are the founder of Writers in Treatment and the Real Re Real Recovery Film Festival and Symposium. You are, and I like this term, we'll talk about it, an addiction survivor. Don't Thank hear you. people uh, describe themselves that way often. An addiction uh, survivor since uh, entering the Betty Ford Center in August 4th of 1994. And you know, I coined that phrase because I didn't like rebranding myself as an alcoholic every time I shared in public or, or mainly at a 12-step meeting. It seemed count counter growth. It seemed counter healing. You know, constantly identify as that. And I read years ago that the reason why people raise their hand and say, I'm Leonard and I'm an alcoholic, because in the early days, people would wander into, you know, cliche of cliche, a church basement, and they would look for the AA meeting. But there were other things going on in the church at the same time. So when they walked into the room, it's really for the newcomer that someone says, hi, I'm Leonard. I'm an alcoholic. Yeah, this is the right room. We're, we're your people. It wasn't meant to wear it as a banner of victory or defeat or however uh, many other reasons uh, or definitions or implications you can give to it. So I realized that I am an addiction survivor. I never 100% identified as an alcoholic. And if I had, it would be, I'm a recovered alcoholic. I haven't had a drink in 27 years. Uh, and, and it's been, you know, obviously an incredible journey. And, and I'm, I'm glad to be, uh, you know, should be addiction thriver. The language that we use in recovery is really important. And you really need to tailor it for whoever you're speaking with at any particular given time. I have found um, mostly people much younger than me have have a lot of difficulty with with the language that we just use all the time. Uh, first of all, the the stigmatizing language of of putting the label alcoholic on you, or just using language of being powerless, or just you, even the word recovery. I've had people tell me they have a problem with that. So it's just all you do too. <laughs> What's your problem with it? Because it's used as in recovery. In recovery, to me, that's like in a box. I don't want a border or, or a frame around me. I don't want to be in anything. I want to be, you know, put loose and fancy free or happy, joyous and free. And it sort of separates me from my fellow man. What I did was stop drinking alcohol and using drugs. And I, I'm very, you know, not ashamed of that. Uh, I don't want to be grouped in with, you know, I think recovery is a very personal journey. I know the, the saying, you know, we recover, you know, and sometimes we'll do the we version of the serenity prayer. And I get that, that I've needed this, my, my people for years, but it's really, if it's an inside job, there's no one else there. So it's it's my accomplishment, it's my journey, it's my uh, uh, surviving. Or anyway, I lost my track of thought because I smoked pot every day for twenty-five <laughs> years. Yes, you did. And my my cognitive functions are a little off. I think you're actually the only drug dealer I've ever met who didn't get caught and go to prison. <laughs> Well, la -da -da. <laughs> so you were able to retire <laughs> successfully, which is good. Isn't that cool? <laughs> I, 
you know, there are times to this day I will actually start to shudder thinking back to what could have happened to me, where I could have ended up. I literally have a, like a moment of intense fear that I was going to like be thrusted back in time and be arrested and go to a prison and get married right away. You know, I'm, I'm, yeah. it's frightening. I, I was kind of, I was kind of going down that road too. I, I got very lucky myself too. So I completely understand that. So you're from Philadelphia originally, and you were, you were born, um, when you were born, uh, at three weeks old, your father died. You, you had a serious, um, heart problem and you had asthma. Your mother, um, was in such a state of shock when your father died that she couldn't breastfeed you even. And reading all those things. And you, when you wrote that, the first thing I thought when I read that was that's a lot of trauma. And I'm wondering, did you put that in your book just to kind of underscore that trauma might have played a role with your addiction or am I just reading something into it that you're reading something into it. I, I, I put it in because it happened. Uh, I say the, the, the trauma of losing my father when I was three weeks old was probably molecular or, or, or unconscious, obviously. But my mother's reaction to that of going into shock, going into intense grief, there were no grief support groups back then. Uh, you know, that was how it physically manifested of suddenly I'm being nurtured and fed and then I'm not. Uh, and I always say every time I asked, you know, a bartenders for a drink, it was to reenact what I didn't get when I was four weeks old. And it worked very well. Right. <laughs> so you, as a, as a boy, you, you were hanging out with these guys. Um, and I think you described it as a candy store or was it, or was it like a, was it like a gambling joint or candy store, but there were gamblers that hung out there. Okay. And you kind of, these guys were your kind of mentors in a way. And is that right? Well, I knew. Yeah. They were, uh, you know, they're almost every day unless they were out scamming something or someone. And they were always very kind to me. It didn't matter that I was 15 and they were 25 or 30. It's like the common denominator was that you, uh, you know, enjoyed conversation. Uh, we like to make each other laugh. I became a gambler. One to fit in, but also because I liked the action of gambling as any you know, I am an ex-compulsive gambler. Uh, I cured my own gambling, just my own gambling addiction by becoming a pot dealer. Because I realized it was such a waste to go to the track and lose $300 when I could buy $300 worth of pot and end up with $400. Why would I go to the track and lose it? So that was, because uh, I was really... Uh, a tried and true compulsive gambler. When I tell people, well, of course, the first time I went to Las Vegas, I had to call my mother and ask her to wire me money to fly home. And I heard, I've heard that other people go to Las Vegas and they don't lose every last penny. They actually have a ticket home or whatever. And I thought, how could, how could that happen? The only way I can win in Las Vegas is if I'm way ahead and I have a flight leaving in an hour <laughs> and they really have to pull me out of the casino. But otherwise I like being in action. It's not that way anymore. I can walk through a casino and not, not play anything or gamble. They call it playing because it's like they manipulate the language. You know, when you go to Las Vegas or Atlantic city, Hey, you want to go play? Hey, no, do you want to go gamble and probably lose? <laughs> yeah. That would be the whole sense. Yeah. <laughs> True. But they call it, you want to go play. Yeah. Okay. I like to play tennis, but I don't like to play slot machines. Well, these, 
these guys that you hung out with, one thing that they did, um, well, they taught you to gamble. They taught you how to make money off the spread. But another thing they did is they took you to the movies. Yes, yes. And is that when you discovered your love for film? Absolutely. We would, you know, we lived in a little neighborhood outside of Center City, Philadelphia. And we often went down to see the first run movies downtown. And we were under the fantasy or the illusion, or I don't know what you would call it. Maybe you have a word for it, where if we got caught speeding and we told the cop, hey, we don't want to miss the first scene of the movie, he would let us go. Like that's how important it is not to miss the first that you would speed. And I thought, oh, if we get pulled over, we'll just tell them we're going to the movies and we can't miss the opening scene. That probably wasn't true, but luckily I don't remember getting pulled over, but I do remember speeding a lot to get to the movie theater on time. Uh, nowadays, you don't have to do that because they have like 15 minutes of trailers before the movie. You know, by the time the trailers are done, I forgot what I actually went to the theater to see. Um, but in those days, and it was foreign films. It wasn't Hollywood product. It was, you know, it was an art house not too far away. We would go. Uh, and it introduced me to a whole other language of films other than you know, comedies and love stories and, and, and that. So I'm very grateful. In fact, I, today it's stay, and I'm sure it's in the book. If there weren't foreign films, I don't know if I could have lasted. As, as I said, drug, you know, films became my drug of choice. Once I got sober, you know, after a week, I thought, I got to get out of my head. I have to go to the theater. And I remember the first time I went, I freaked out. Because I'd never been to a movie theater not high on, on pot. And the first time I went completely sober, I felt my muscles releasing THC into my body where I had to think, did I get high on the way over here? Yeah. Because after being you know, high in theaters, a thousand times and then you go not on anything the body has a memory and it remembers being high and it was a little uncomfortable until i told myself no you didn't get high this is just thc is still being released from your muscles where it's stored for weeks if not months and just uh you know go with it deal with it uh, that doesn't happen anymore now i'm like sober as a as a, I don't know, I would say a judge, but I don't know if there's <laughs> right. any judges anymore. Maybe that was like a, a satire, a satirical statement way back when. Uh, so, you, you know, uh, so to start a film festival 14 years ago was like... 14 years ago. It, wow. Yeah. It was like the butter on my bread uh, to be able to do that and make a living. and we get 150 submissions a year from around the world, uh, shorts, documentaries, feature length films, and I have to watch them, you know, unless they really stink by the middle. Uh, but, uh, you know, if, like, if, if it's not, you know, I'm very proud to say I've never seen anybody walk out of a film at our film festival because they're compelling and they're interesting and they're well made. Uh, and they're not B movies. They're all A movies. You know, whether it's 18 minutes or 80 minutes, uh, we, we have animated films, uh, you know, artsy films, straight narrative films. Uh, and, 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 and the thing that separates the Real Recovery Film Festival and Symposium is the end symposium part. Because after every film, we either have a filmmaker talk to the audience about why and how they made the film, or if we don't have the filmmaker, we will have a clinician, a drug counselor, a psychologist, do a talk back with the audience. 
That is so interesting. Or I call it a mini process group. Like, let's talk about what we've seen. Let's critique what we've seen. Let's discuss how it made you feel. You know, what, was there a trigger? Do you now feel really happy about being sober because you see somebody on the screen who's not? You know, is, is it a cautionary tale? Or does it really make uh, clean and sober living look good? And aren't you a lucky son of a gun for not putting substances in your body anymore that could destroy you? You know, whether it's a little or a lot, uh, this seems like the drug scene today is not what it used to be. Uh, and there's a marijuana store on every other block in Los Angeles. It's tremendous. It's one of the greatest improvements to American life that I've ever lived through. You know, gay marriage, legalized marijuana. You know, it was barbaric 20 years ago. People will look back at this here and think, they put young black boys in jail for having two joints in their pocket, you know, for years. Or, or uh, you know, they lock people up for enjoying themselves. You know, it's not even a victimless crime. It's a drug policy crime. Like how some husband can sit in front of the TV and smile and, and, and you know, drink a half a bottle of Jim Beam, get nasty to his wife, and the guy next door is snorting four lines of Coke. He can be arrested, but the guy with his bottle of Beam, being a creep, is legal. So it's really a distorted, you know, it really was. It wasn't a, dr a war on drugs. It was a war on, on underprivileged. It was a war on people who, as you said, suffered trauma and used drugs to relieve it. I'm going to stop talking now because I don't want to interrupt you again. Take the, take the, it's your show. No, you're, no, you're fine. I loved it. But I'm surprised I never, I'm surprised I never heard about the film festival because this is something that I would, I would love. And um, I'm going to check it out. I, you know, when I, when I first stopped drinking, um, there was a film that came out in 1988, which was the year I, got, I stopped drinking. And it was uh, called Clean and Sober uh, with Michael Keaton in it. And I remember um, watching that movie and it had a really, it had a really strong impact on me because there was a scene in that movie I'll never forget that made me feel exact. The character in the film felt exactly what I was feeling at that time. And what happened was it was a scene where, oh, he had done something terrible to some girl or something. And I can't remember exactly what it was, but he was found out and his neighbors posted notes all over his door about what he had done. And he came back and he found this. And I remember just feeling that, that fear and that dread of they found out about me. They know the truth. Because that was really what my bottom was, was when I was confronted by other people that we know about you. You know, and that anyway, so anyway, the, the film was very powerful and it had a big, big impact on me. And to this day, we still do, I'll still do a podcast about a film and talk about a, a recovery related film or, and so I'm surprised I never knew about this. So, so it's wonderful to learn about this. You know, one of my favorite films that I saw right after I got sober was Leaving Las Vegas. Oh my God. Yeah. Nicholas Cage film. And there's a line in the film where his girlfriend says, how come you're drinking yourself to death? And he said, I had a good reason, but I forgot what it was. <laughs> and so the alcohol just took over and, and, and doing that. Uh, we've never been in Kansas. We've been in New York. We're in LA for a week uh, every year. Fort Lauderdale, we've been in Denver and San Francisco and Las Vegas. So do you travel or do, are these that and you do in different places? New York and LA is, is every year, every October, November. And in years past, we've been asked to bring it oh. to other places. Interesting. Richmond, Virginia and uh, Vancouver, Canada. We were there for a few years. So maybe there's someone in Kansas 
It was the Kansas City. Kansas City. We're in Kansas City, Missouri. Kansas City, who is wants to bring us there for like a three day festival, like a Friday night soiree, uh, you know, meet and greet with a movie. And then all day Saturday and all day Sunday, we can show films. It's possible. There's a there's a great arts community here in Kansas City. We have a we have a really great um, uh, theater community here. A lot of different theater companies and uh, stuff like that. So it's uh, there's a for a city of our size, it's it's pretty incredible. I think I'm, I'm pretty proud of that, and I've always enjoyed that. But it's always possible. You never know. I might maybe. Who who by the way sponsors this beautiful podcast? Oh heck, um, I. Um, right now we do have a sponsor, Soberlink, um, <laughs> Soberlink. They're not, I don't have them listed here anywhere right now, but I put them, I, is that the, is that the test, test yes, yes. <laughs> yes, they're a sponsor they, of they help. my newsletter, the Addiction Recovery e-bulletin that comes out once a week. It's a, it's an, it's an e-magazine. It's uh, completely different every Tuesday. Soberlink is one of our supporters. Have an ad on there. They're very nice people. Um, you know, what, they they came to me and they they asked me if I if they'd like to if I'd like to have them as a sponsor, and I thought, okay, well, I thought, well, first of all, I wonder if my listeners are, are going to have a problem with a breathalyzer um, <laughs> company, you know, sponsoring the podcast or whatever. But they also do a lot of good work with the recovery community and are very supportive of that, and they've been wonderful to me. So, yeah, they've been great. They keep the roads safe. They do. Because their biggest customers were trucking oh. companies. And the drivers, because when you breathe into it, it takes your picture, takes your blood alcohol, and sends your location to wherever it's programmed to send it. So trucking agencies got a re- reduction on their insurance costs because their drivers would blow into it before they took off on their trip and it would made the roads a little safer. So Soberlink does a lot of things. Yeah, they're good. They've been good to me. So does the um, experience strength and hope awards follow the film festival? Or is it connected to that? Or is that a different, a different thing altogether? It's a completely freestanding event that we were doing uh, in March of uh, every year, but then the, with the pandemic came through, and so we had to postpone it for two years, and we had it in this last December. And it's in this beautiful museum uh, where we have the honorees, and um, someone does some music, comedian is the host, and it's the Experience, Strength, and Hope Awards. And those are for books, for authors. Those are for memoirs, for people. Not for sobriety, it's for people like Buzz Aldrin who took the time to write a memoir about his alcoholism and his journey. Lou Gossett Jr., the Academy Award-winning actor, he wrote a book. Uh, John Taylor, the co-founder of Duran Duran, had a book. He was the recipient one year. Uh, You know, terrific, terrific people. Mackenzie Phillips actress and advocate she got the award one year uh, pat o'brien the legendary sports announcer he wrote a terrific book his book is like a who's who of the 1980s and 90s in sports and show business because he started the show access hollywood you know and he, he was the the uh the narrator on like four olympics you know, which means that's like a 16-year spread. Anyway, so Pat O'Brien. So that's something uh, we do separate from the film festival. Memoirs are great. I like reading them. I enjoyed reading yours. And I wonder if you could tell me what, what inspired you to write this. Uh, because I had... Um, You know, I, I say because I have two sons and I wanted to leave them something where they would get to know me. Uh, they're very proud of me that I wrote this. I don't think they've ever been. I've never been as proud of myself for anything as I've ever done as write this book. It took eight to 10 years. It's very hard work. And if you want to experience how old you actually are, 
quite a memoir. <laughs> And delve back in. I thought you were going to say when I talked about the asthma and the heart condition. It's, you know, you have to be willing to uh, you know, to look at those things. And almost to re-experience some of it. Uh, you know, I realized that having had asthma, serious asthma as a kid, that was very traumatic. Uh, you know, I've been in too many ambulances being rushed to the hospital not lately uh, but in my life and so i never had like a well that was a long illness that was that's that's a disease you want to talk about a disease asthma you wrote too that you almost felt as if you were a burden to your family because of these these ailments well uh, i was a burden to my family because my mother never knew when the next phone call was going to be me in the police station or a hospital. She was more concerned about that. Uh, you know, being in a hospital, A, due to an asthma attack or an injury or, or some other, you know, act of violence against me because, uh, you know, drug dealers do, uh, you know, it's not the safest career, but it's a career. And I got very lucky. Yeah. yeah, very lucky. You started smoking marijuana in high school. Was it your senior year in high? High school. Okay. Yes, which I think is the appropriate time to start smoking. <laughs> and um, from the beginning, it, you knew that was the that was the thing for you, basically. Love at first talk. It it made my life go from black and white to color. And five years later, when I started doing cocaine, we went from color to technicolor, to 3D. It was a great compliment to to the to the weed, or I don't know what they call it now, ganja. The time. There's a great little piece in the New York Times on Sunday. It was an interview with an actress about what keeps her going and her favorite things and her favorite authors and made movie. And the last thing was. Indica. And she says, it's indica. I have a tincture of indica that I put three drops under my tongue at night and it helps me sleep. Then she says, one time they accidentally mixed it with sativa. And that was all wrong because all the sativa made her want to do was get up and write down new ideas. <laughs> you know, the body, the body high, the head high. I'm not promoting marijuana in any way during this podcast. Uh, And if you've never smoked, but if you've never smoked pot, then maybe now's the time. (laughs) Okay, true. Unless you're happy and healthy and grooving. I think it does have some qualities. Another thing I found interesting about your story is I I always figured that people got into drug dealing by accident. That it just kind of happened that, you know what, I can, I can, I can supply myself by selling some of the stuff, but it's like you, you made a decision that this is, this was a career decision that you made. And you even told your mother that this is what you would like to do. Yes, I did. Uh, Because I was bored with her lifestyle, her lifestyle of working nine to five, coming home, you know, throwing a Swanson TV dinner in the oven. (laughs) Watch, you know, watching TV, sending me down to the candy store to buy a half a gallon of Breyer's ice cream, vanilla fudge. And, I, and, and then I happened to have some pot, sold it to, was selling it to a guy in high school, and I had to meet him at 8 o'clock at night somewhere. And I thought, wow, this is exciting. I have a meeting. I have a business meeting at 8 o'clock at night. I have an appointment, so to speak. I'm making money. Uh, it made me feel alive. And that's not why I did it, but, if, but, but it kept me awake for all those years. Because when you're a drug dealer, you don't drink a lot. You don't drink and drive when you have 20 pounds of pot in the trunk. It keeps you alert. It keeps you alert. Uh, you're always aware of your surroundings and the people that you meet. And it was, uh, but it was a little accidental. It was, I got into it in a big way accidentally. I was actually selling 
women's clothing to boutiques around Philadelphia and New York and Maryland. And the guy I was working for, and I think the only reason I was working for him was because he was a student of macrobiotics. So being around him, I was learning about Japanese oriental philosophy and lifestyle. And I liked being around him. I mentioned something about needing, a, you know, a, 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 boy, if I had a pound of pot, I could. And he said, oh, my brother is one of the biggest pot dealers in Miami. And I said, give me his number. And now I could go to people and say, hey, I can get 300 pounds of pot in Miami at a very reduced rate because this guy was a big importer. And that's how I got into it on a, on a, as a career. Before then, it was just the sideline. But once that happened, uh, and I borrowed 30000 from a neighbor, and uh, that I was often, often running, so to speak. Uh, yeah. Going many now into the future, and you're learning about recovery, and one of the things you wrote was something that um, you have to learn to sit with the boredom. You have to kind of lower your expectations for excitement or something along those lines. And I, and I, and I almost think that it's like, you know, we're almost addicted to that drama and that excitement as much as we are. That's part of, they asked Robert Downey Jr. once, what, why were you such a, crazy drug dealer. And he says, I think I was addicted to the sneaking around, you know, going out at midnight to meet somebody. That's, that's interesting. That's dramatic. That's cinematic. Uh, I mean, eventually it gets, it, it'll get you in a lot of trouble. Uh, so, you know, the, the, uh, the, except, what were you just saying? I, well, I, something about we had to, you had to sit, you, had, you almost have to sit with the boredom. Oh, oh, in recovery, I was a drug counselor. And I would tell, I did a group of, you have to find your inner nerd. You know, eventually you're going to be a nerd from time <laughs> right. to time. You're not always going to be hip, slick, and cool. Uh, and, and get used to the board and get used to reading. You know, at least if you're reading a book, you know, you can't be bored. But get used to it because more people, I think, have relapses not when they get a raise at work, but when, no, I mean, not when they get fired, but when they get a raise, because now they have, you know, some freedom, some energy, some money. But when, when you get fired from a job, you know, you call your sponsor, you go to a meeting, you talk about it, and it's okay. And the same thing with boredom, when you're doing things, your mind, you and your mind and your body are occupied. And, and, you know, the old saying, idle hands are the devil's tools or playground. So I think same thing when you're in at least early recovery, you know, uh, and that to me is the definition of a good rehab, where they keep you busy from morning till night, you know, a little downtime, a little nap time, but keep people busy and focused on, I always said, Rehab is the greatest place in the world if you happen to be a narcissist. Because when you check in to a treatment facility, all they want to know, all, all they want you to talk about is yourself. Right. <laughs> they want you to write about yourself and talk about and go to group and tell people how you're feeling, and tell people about how you, how you used to feel. Uh, so it, it's, it's, you know, I think anybody out there who's on the cusp or the precipice of a disastrous drug or alcohol uh, mistake, going away for a month is, is like, it's, it's, it's better than any vacation. You know, I mean, self-discovery is more exciting than most anything else I can imagine. It is. And I th- and it does take a lot of courage. You wrote about that. And I think that, I think a lot of us, when we, when we, um, we get, we get lost in our addiction, we lose ourselves. And, you know, we, at least I did. I, I, um, I, I needed to figure out why I reacted the way I did 
to things. And so taking the time to look at my past was constructive in that I was able to see some patterns of, of, uh, about why I was behaving or reacted in certain ways so that I could change my behaviors going forward. It did, it, and it was important to take a look at yourself like that, I thought. Mm-hmm. But may I ask, if I'm not being too personal, what was your drug of Oh, alcohol. Good old yeah, alcohol. Yeah, I couldn't, I did smoke marijuana, but it would make me very, very paranoid. And I just. <laughs> right. And I couldn't drink during the day because it gave me a headache. <laughs> I had to drink a lot, especially if there was a cocaine or ecstasy uh, to snort. In our very first film festival 14 years ago, we showed two of the greatest classics, The Days of Wine and Roses and, of course, Lost Weekend, which is a little overly dramatic. But there's a scene in The Days of Wine and Roses where Jack Lemon has hidden the bottle in the nursery. He doesn't remember what plant he hid, and he's, and he's like dirt, you know, just intense. And like, it's hard to watch because you can see them, and there's no better example on film of craving than, than I think, The Days of Wine and Roses which I'm sure is streaming on some channel somewhere. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a good one. I, there's, there's, uh, there's a lot of movies out there. Uh, every, every time, anytime I watch a movie, that that's a scene. That's, that's a good, that's a good scene. But uh, the, the, mo- the, the scenes that always get me that, that make me, that bring up the emotion is the scene where the addict is finally confronting the truth. You know, that moment when you, when, when they say, I am, I, I'm an alcoholic or I, I need help or that, that moment for when you're finally realizing the truth. And I think, I think the reason that I, it, it affects me so much is when I see that on the screen is because that is what, when I, when I was first getting sober, it blew me away that I um, couldn't see that I had this problem. You know, denial is more powerful than active addiction because it's all brain chemistry. It literally is in your head, and you can be in full on denial about other people and certainly your own habits. It wasn't until I did, and then I'll I'll let you go. But uh, the first step in alcohol synonymous is, and I did it at the rehab where I had to write down. 10 incidences that could have had a catastrophic effect, that could have ended catastrophically based on my using and drinking. And so it took me a couple of days and I wrote down these 10 incidences and then you have to, you know, share it with the other guys. And it was only when I read it, I thought, this person is insane. Whoever wrote this is perhaps crazy and suicidal. This is, this is someone who is suicidal. But it's only when you condense it all on paper, written by hand, that it's... Because if you do something suicidal every six months, you forget that you did it. You know, if you, or if you drive drunk dangerously a year later, you forget. But when you write it all out, you think, oh, my God, this person is insane. If you go insane slowly, no one will notice. But when you write about all these, you know, potentially exactly. disaster things, so that's what made me think, okay, there's no question I belong here. Right, right. So I, I, I want to go through some of the, the lessons I think that I drew from your book, and a lot of this comes towards the end of the book. And one thing I wanted to ask you about, there was something you wrote uh, when drug addicts are lying, they're not really lying; they're just surviving. And we, we, um, I, I'm, I kind of come from the secular community within AA, and uh, we're a bunch of atheists and agnostics, and we have to interpret the steps in ways that are meaningful to us. And um, character defects, for example, is a is a really difficult word for people in that community, and. Um, a lot of them, a lot of us will think of our character defects as coping mechanisms. And so when I read that, when you wrote that, I'm, I, is that, I was wondering if that's where you were coming from, you know, the lying wasn't necessarily 
a defect or, or something you were doing wrong, but it was your way to survive. It was a coping mechanism. Again, am I reading too much uh, into it? <laughs> no, 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 no. I meant that. When uh, an addict is lying about something, they're just doing it to keep the, keep the parade going, to not get off the merry-go-round because they feel comfortable. They, they feel comfortable in their uncomfortableness on the merry-go-round. And the fear of the unknown is more frightening than fear of, of, what, of things that have already bad happened to you. You know, you know I can handle that. But, but the unknown is very frightening. They did a study once uh, where they took uh, uh, foster children uh, away from their initial or original parents. And then like two months later, they say, uh, do you want to go home where you were being abused or do you want to go to this better foster home? And invariably, some of them will say, I want to go home because at least I know what to expect. But the new parents in the new home is an unknown and that's more frightening than the, the, the you know, the... Uh, the, the the difficulties that you've already been experiencing, but that's not the point of that sentence. Uh, people will do anything to keep their habit fresh or alive. Uh, that's why there's crime. If you don't have money, you know that's why. Uh, uh, you know, if you have money, who cares how much drugs you use as long as you're not stealing to get it uh and but the, the government cared because they needed to fill up the prison industrial complex uh, corporation but that's besides the point um i would tell people that i just had to think on my feet because there was always a there's always there was always a problem and i had to get out of it and lying sometimes was a good way to get out of it so um it was how i dealt with things i suppose until it's it how you work. kept the, kept going until it doesn't work anymore. If you're a heroin addict and there's a, literally a monkey on your back and someone says, hey, you know, there's a monkey on your back. You'll say, no, there's not. There's no monkey. <laughs> Even though there's a monkey. Because if there was no monkey, you might not get your fix. Uh, so let me just throw out one film recommendation. And I know it's called Half Nelson. F. Nelson with uh, the blonde guy oh, who was in La La Land. What's his name? F. Nelson. A perfect story about a New York City school teacher. And it's one of the few pure crackhead movies. Uh, but it's terrific. F. Nelson starring... We'll, we'll find out, but I'll check that out. You know, I'm so glad that I learned about this because I, I, I didn't even know that that many movies existed that had to deal with addiction and recovery. You know, when, when I started the film festival, I, my, 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 my figurehead partner at the time was Rob, Bob Downey, senior filmmaker. He said, I'm just going to worry you going to run out of movies because he was just thinking Hollywood blockbusters. But there are so many independent films, documentaries from different countries. This is, you know, filmmakers, be they professional, and, and Hollywood produces a few great drug movies every year. Rocket Man, I think, being the last great one. Uh, and certainly TV shows. Have you seen Dope Sick on Hulu? Oh, my God. It's a true story about how Big Pharma actually created the opiate epidemic that kills 100,000 people a year. How they are 100% responsible. But it stars Michael Keaton. So if you like Michael Keaton in... in, in clean and uh, Sober. Clean and Sober, you'll love him in this because he's not clean and sober. He is when it starts, but he's not. Uh, Check that out. But we get, uh, like I said, 150 submissions a year. 20-minute films, 80-minute films. 90 minute films, uh, and, they're, and the only ones we take are ones that we like, that we love, actually. 
We don't want to bore anybody or make anybody squirm in their seat. We want their attention full on. So if there's somebody else in the community in, in Kansas City, we can bring it to Kansas City. We have a published a manual called How to Produce a Successful Real Recovery hey, Film Festival in your town. Oh, interesting. Oh, maybe there's a, a film lover in AA or a company and a local rehab, perhaps. Well, that's really interesting. I might actually um, look into that for, for you. I think I would love to see something like that in Kansas City. Um, I was going to ask you, uh, so uh, these movies are independently made. Is there a way that people can see them that don't go to the festival, that can't go to the festival? Is are, because they might not be they might not be put out anywhere. Well, half of them get to Netflix. Half of them get to Netflix. You can call us. I don't know if we've published that. Go on our website, realrecoveryfilmfestival.org. And real is R E E L because in the early days of the film festival, we literally had a rent 35 millimeter film. Oh. And now that it doesn't even exist. Oh, anymore. interesting. So it's real, R-E-E-L, realrecoveryfilmfestival.org. We have a lot of uh, our past events, our past film festivals. So you can poke around there and find some titles you've never heard of. Okay, I'll do that. See where you can get them. I'll check that out. Okay. So anyway, um, I, I think our time is up, but I, I thank you so very much for, for being here with me. I appreciate it. My pleasure, John Shelby. <laughs> it was nice to meet you. You, LA. Hmm? you must do you, ever, do you ever get to Los Angeles? I actually have only been to Los Angeles once, and I went to Santa Monica, and it was the most beautiful place I think I've ever seen. I love Santa Monica. I just like the vibe of the place. Very nice. It's, okay. It's not where I live, but it is a beautiful place. <laughs> well, good. There's some time. Well, I have a good reason to come back. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank okay. you very much. I appreciate your time. All right. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.